Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sly of the Underworld from The Age, John Sylvester. Thank you very much. When the um, Melbourne Press Club Committee asked me to speak, they said you can speak about anything, which is fantastic because my chosen topic is the social, economical and philosophical issues facing professional practitioners in the social media. <laughs> I only said that to see the look on Paul Ramage's face with the thought he'd have to listen to 20 minutes of total bilge. So I'm going to talk about what I know about, which is um, drug-addled psychopaths <laughs> and women who perform lewd sexual acts. And that's just at the Quill after party. <laughs> so if you will indulge me, I'm going to try and talk about how crime reporting has changed over the last 30 years. And it's going to be a fairly personal journey, because as you know, it is all about me. <laughs> so I'm going to take you back. But first off, you've got to imagine, for example, that I didn't always look as I do now, which is brooding strangely sexually attractive. <laughs> and a Yule Brenner look-alike. <laughs> if you go back to 1978, I look totally different. And I want you to imagine when I walked in on my first day at the Herald and Weekly Times building to start at the Sun, I was wearing skin-tight flares, uh, a body shirt, the top button undone with the tie just a little so, because I'd seen all the President's men and uh, hard to believe I was even more attractive. <laughs> now, I don't know what you're laughing about because I tell you, I did have the best bottom in journalism. <laughs> you could eat your dinner off it, it was that good. <laughs> so I walked into my editor's office, John Morgan, and I said, where's my office? He laughed. <laughs> and um, the only place I could put my pen, which was a present, a gold pen, which was a present for my father, was in the tiny little slit pocket because everything else was on so tight. I think I might have even been going commando on the day, but <laughs> too far, perhaps. Um, and he looked me up and down, he saw the gold pen, and he said, leave that at home, son, it'll get stolen here. And I thought, you cynical old bastard. And three days later, it was stolen. <laughs> so I learnt my first lesson in journalism, listen to your editor. So I fluffed around there at the sun for about six months, not doing much. And uh, finally they said, you better go up and have a look at police rounds on rotation. Now, police rounds in those days was a small little office in the Russell Street building, which was, the building was actually built to look like the Empire State Building. So I went in, turned right, and there was the Herald and the Sun room. And it was the first time I'd seen a real live police report, and his name was Jim Tennyson. And he, well, I didn't actually see him because he was enveloped in Marlboro cigarette smoke <laughs> and had a large glass of malt whiskey which surprised me because it was 10 in the morning. <laughs> and he said, welcome to the biggest round in the biggest paper in the big country. And then he promptly hopped on a desk, got three phone books and fell asleep. <laughs> so I didn't know really what to do. I sat there for a while. And then another bloke arrived. His name was Jeff Wilkinson. And uh, he was very neat and very dapper. In fact, he was the neatest straight bloke I've ever seen. <laughs> and he mumbled something and he wandered into his cubicle. And when I say cubicle, a battery hen would have resigned to work in there. <laughs> but he, he showed me the art of multi-skilling. He had two telephones in those days before mobiles. One was a 1837 was the extension, the other was 1601. Uh, he had a battered old imperial typewriter from World War II. And then he turned on the police scanner and his little transistor radio so that he could simultaneously listen to a bashing in uh, Broadmeadows and the last leg of the races at Benalla. <laughs> and as was he, his wand, he lost both. <laughs> but he gave the second law of journalism, which he told all of us, which was be right and assume nothing. And that stuck with me and a generation who went through that period of tutelage with Jeff Wilkinson. Police rounds in those days was a lot different. There wasn't the media monitors as such. 
And one day a member of the armed robbery squad, Graham Crease, walked in and said, would you boys help us out in a lineup? Now we're all about the same, we're in our mid-twenties, Palaco shirts, polyester pants. We took our ties off and we went upstairs and my heart sunk because sitting in the corner was a bloke and he looked like death, he was five foot two, he had a ripped jeans and he was black. And I thought, you're kidding. You can't put us up against him as a suspect. They said, don't worry, boys, he's a visiting detective from Papua New Guinea. <laughs> Two days later, he was hospitalised with alcohol poisoning. <laughs> so we go into the auditorium, and I started to jerry about what was going on here because there was a guy there, he had runners on, he had no laces. He had black stovepipe um, jeans, he had a black T-shirt, I think it was Black Sabbath. He had the beginnings of a black eye and he had, that, he had a mullet and he had that fashion statement that never really caught on, which was the tear, little tear tattoo and the little tear here, that star here. So I thought, you might be the suspect. So I thought, I stood next to him and it was a bank robbery in Clifton Hill. So in comes the bank manager and he walks up and down and I could see in his eyes that he recognised this guy. But he said, I can't help you. I later found out that that bank had previously been robbed. So I thought, this is not too good. And in came the, uh, the next person, which was a 19-year-old female teller. And she looked green as grass, and I thought, well, maybe we can help this process and speed it up a bit. So as she walked along, because I was next to the suspect, I started just to go, warm. <laughs> warmer. <laughs> hot. <laughs> and then made some sizzling noises. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, she picked the guy, uh, he got 12 years, and we got a slab of Crown Lagers. So you see, that's how the justice system worked back in those days. The armed robbery squad was certainly different. There was a um, parking officer who tried to become a policeman, and he'd failed, so he had a set against them. And in the back of Russell Street was the car park at Mackenzie Street. And he used to go there and try and book off-duty uh, uh, police's private cars. Now, the armed robbery squad weren't happy with that, so what they did was they used an exhibit, which was a high-powered air rifle, and they started to actually snipe at him while he was doing this. <laughs> and for a fairly tubby fellow who was quite robust, he would be doing sort of combat roles and putting these things on there. He was the only parking officer ever entitled to march at um, Anzac Day. Um, but eventually the police tired of that, and he was arrested with um, resist arrest, assault police, and a few other things, and that was the end of him. In that office at Police Rounds, there were these files. And so you could go back and you could read stories by the, the greats, Hugh Buggy, Seaton Ashton, Alan Dower, all these legends. And it became quite clear that Police Rounds hadn't changed. The stories were written the same way. Only the make of the car changed. The armed robbery, the bandit escaped in a Model T Ford, a DeSoto, a Studebaker, and finally a Commodore. So we were writing stories the same way they'd always been written. I'm uh, sure it was a pretty hard living life. You worked hard, you played hard. I read recently that uh, Canberra reporters of the day <coughs> had a 17 hour lunch. Fantastic. We had a word for that at police rounds. We called that brunch. <laughs> but the world was changing, even though we didn't know it. Because the old crooks, the people who w lived locally, would do a robbery and then go to their pub, have a mixed grill, Stagger home with two bottles of Abbott's and the Sporting Globe was going. And what we were getting was drugs and we were starting to come into an area of organised crime, sophisticated crime and corruption. And thank goodness that there was somebody like Jeff Wilkinson at The Sun who was able to grasp that. Now most big changes in the media that you've seen come in degrees, but I can tell you when it happened, when we morphed from just simple cops and robbers to investigative work and corruption work, and it was May 1979. Um, Jeff, as chief police reporter, was never a byline bandit, and he would always allow his reporters to make the running. In May 79, two bodies were found in a shallow grave in Rye, Isabel and Douglas Wilson. And the reporter of the day, who was on, on, made the running, he probably had two or three page one leads, and he wrote them in the traditional style. Uh, police were baffled, evidence went to forensic, Seasoned detectives were kicking indoors. And I remember on a Friday, he was full of his own self-importance 
and uh, beer from the happy hour at the police club and he came into the police rounds and he looked at Jeff and said, hey, don't worry about that story, I'll cover it next week. And I remember Jeffrey's uh, eyebrow rose about two centimetres and I thought, this could be interesting, this will be trouble. And uh, so I watched with interest and that Monday, there was a page one lead in the Herald Sun that said Isabel and Douglas Wilson were in fact police informers on a major drug syndicate and that they had been, uh, that information had been leaked to the syndicate and that's why they had been killed. He said it was the Federal Narcotics Bureau. The minister of the day, Wal Fife, made a statement saying that it was nonsense and that Jeff Wilkinson was a fantasist and a cross-dresser. Well, he might have been half right, but <laughs> regardless of that, Jeffrey always took Monday off because he liked to go to the trots and then he'd go home and watch the television series The Sweeney, which either showed he was quite pathetic or pretty dedicated to crime reporting. But on that Monday he worked and his editor, the same bloke who ticked me off over the pen, John Morgan, backed him and had another page one story which said that this syndicate, the Mr Asia syndicate, had done this. And we look forward now and it's got the shades of Terry and Christine Hodson to see that these police informers were executed because the information was leaked. It took six or eight months before that story actually got traction and finally there was an inquiry. And in the end, the Federal Narcotics Bureau was disbanded. And some of us have written stories which may have resulted in exposure of a corrupt policeman. But to actually expose a whole bureau, a whole law enforcement agency, and have it closed down is one of the most amazing things we've seen in Australian journalism. It didn't win a war clip. It didn't win a Walkley, it should, and if there was a retrospective gold one, he should get one tomorrow. And that's all very well, that's great, yeah, blah, 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 you've, you've actually just closed a law enforcement agency, but the true mark of a crime reporter is the ability to nickname crooks. <laughs> but without that, you're just a passenger. <laughs> and there was the occasion where there was a series of um, robberies in the bush in winter. TABs, banks, places like that. And um, the police reasoned, you would think sensibly, that the reason the bandit was doing it was because he could escape in the cover of darkness. That's why when daylight saving happened, he wouldn't do anything. So Jeffrey started writing these stories and nicknamed this fellow the After Dark Bandit, which was a great name. But Lindsay Murdoch of the Age was horrified to think that the son had nicknamed this crook. So he looked at the security pictures and saw that on one occasion, the offender was wearing a gorilla mask. So he started to call him the monkey face bandit, <laughs> which sounds more like a biscuit. So <laughs> that was never going to work. And finally, Lindsay had to admit defeat and started calling him the after dark bandit. <laughs> the truth of the matter was that the offender did it in winter because he was scared of snakes. And if you nicknamed him the scaredy snakey bandit, <laughs> that was never going to work at all. And the reality of the story is that it was not one, it was two. Peter K. Morgan and Douglas K. Morgan, twins, who were doing these jobs in one of the most fascinating stories in Melbourne crime. And Geoffrey wrote letter and verse on the twins, the whole story, and even today, 20 years on, he remains in contact with the police who were involved in it and both Peter K. and Douglas K. Morgan. So that is contact journalism. <laughs> Finally, Geoffrey decided he'd have had enough of this and he went down to become Deputy Chief of Staff at The Sun, which uh, during this period of time he would ring us up and annoy the shit out of us uh, because he wanted us to write page one and always relied heavily on the crime stories. And when he decided to move, he was actually headhunted by the Chief Commissioner of the day, Mick Miller. And Mick Miller said, I want somebody who is going to behave like a journalist who is totally honest. I don't want another copper. I've got 8,000 of them. And Jeff became the media director. And while he would whinge and whine and carry on if he thought things were not done in fairness to the police, there was one thing. He never lied. In those days, the only spin was the police rounds car at three in the morning. <laughs> he did the job the way it should be. And he did something else. He got a Churchill Fellowship and he headed overseas and he came back with a little idea called Crime Stoppers. <laughs> 
And that means that, and that has now been embraced in every state of Australia. And the funny thing is that Jeff Wilkinson is responsible for the arrest and conviction of more criminals than any single policeman in the history of Australia. <laughs> he then moved to the electronic media and went to television where he was a backroom boy, which was uh, probably pretty wise. That's before Gay FM. So he, um, he moved in there, he did, he did uh, the news and he did a current affair. And after that sojourn, he came back and he came back to his first love, which is the Herald and Weekly Times. And uh, I just think it's fascinating and fantastic that a man with that experience still can whinge if he's on page three. He's like a giant moray eel who just comes out of his office to yell at people and then goes back. <laughs> and he has the passion and commitment that I wish every one of us did. And I think of him, and I think that there's a little bit of him in your Andrew Rawls and myself and all these different people who learnt that mantra that still exists today. Be right and assume nothing. So Geoffrey, it's been a long journey from the mailroom of the Heldon Weekly Times to Newsday where you failed as a sports reporter when you tried to throw a typewriter out of the Victoria Park press box because the umpire gave a decision against Collingwood <laughs> to winning a series of awards including in the Australian Honours. But nothing gives me more pleasure than to say that you, Jeff Wilkinson, should come up here because you are the Lifetime Achievement Award winner. I've known George since 1969. Looks, I know, Jeff, isn't it? I know it's Jeff, but actually, George and I worked on Newsday in 1969. He was sent away to a major assignment to cover a, the stall gift. Went away in the company car, sent back the story from stall, and said by George Wilkinson. And ever since that date, Greg Hobbs, who worked at Newsday, and I have always referred to Jeff Wilkinson as George. So he's been George for, uh, for 40 years for me.